Are the Qigong meridians even real? We'll talk about that and more in today's Walk and Talk. I'm Sifu Anthony, and I'm out here in the salt flats of Utah with my camper van and my trusty co-pilot. Say hi, buddy. Say hi. There's nothing out here, as I'll show you in a moment, but he's confused by the open space. He's kind of barking at uh, cars miles in the distance, which you probably will not be able to see. Let me show you around where I am. I just arrived. I'm very much looking forward to doing some Qigong here. Those are the salt flats in the distance there. You can see a little bluish tint. It looks a little bit like a lake. Hopefully that will show on the camera. And it's just incredible. And I'm up here in the hills with a view of it all, way above it. Pretty spectacular. So let's walk and talk. I apologize for the sunglasses. It is bright out here, so uh, we'll just have to make do. Okay, so a question I get a lot is, you know, the meridians, the Qigong meridians, where are they? You know, if you dissect a human body, will you find them? Uh, the answer is no. Of course, you will not find them. Otherwise, they would have found them already. Uh, well, maybe, and we'll talk about that in a second. Maybe they would have found them, or maybe not. Uh, so I think it's a fair question, and it's, it's fair to question in general, ideally in a respectful way, but to question the wisdom of the past masters that we've inherited. Let me back up a little bit. Let me talk about the Qigong meridians. Uh, we're talking about the same thing, whether we're dealing with Qigong, acupuncture, uh, Chinese herbal medicine, Chinese massage, which is called Tui Na. Regardless of which of these systems we're operating from, we're still using the same theory of the meridians. So we all share the same meridian system. Uh, so, you know, I, when I went to acupuncture college, I learned the meridians and the points. Now, of course, I, it, it, it was more like Qigong College for me. That's the main reason I went. But it didn't matter because the system underneath is the same. So when I talk about the meridians, I'm talking about this ancient system that is thousands of years old and that we've inherited through many different traditions. It's all the same. So I call them the Qigong meridians, but they're the same as the acupuncture meridians, which are the same as the Tui Na meridians and the Chinese herbology meridians. It's all the same. Okay, so now, where, where are they? Well, we know where they are. We know we have very clear descriptions and charts of where they are. Where they are. So we know, you know the heart, heart meridian starts over here, runs down the arm, and ends in the, the pinky uh, on both sides, bilateral. Uh, and we know exactly where these points are. And you know, there seems to be something there. You know, for example, if you take a voltmeter on these acupuncture points, it, it changes. There's something going on in these acupuncture points, which are basically sort of like a loci, you know, many locuses of uh, energy at these acupuncture points. And we also know that if you stick needles in certain points, you have certain uh, responses. And if you prescribe herbs that nourish or do something for particular meridians, we, we see the effect. So, we have evidence it's just it's just not of the kind of you know dissecting a body and finding a spleen or dissecting a body and finding lymph nodes it's a little bit different than that so but let's talk about that because we live in very interesting times we live in a time when we assume i think most of us assume that pretty much everything in the human body has been discovered just kind of, you know it's kind of like we feel like every corner of the earth has been mapped and uh, well, I actually don't know about that. I, I would actually, so maybe I'm ignorant in that category. I don't know if every corner of the, the earth has been mapped or not. I would assume so, but maybe I'm wrong. But I do know that when it comes to the human body, uh, there are still, there's still, there is still undiscovered country. And I'll give you some examples. So for example, in 2018, uh, many articles popped up about a new organ discovered by Western researchers. This is not Eastern medicine at all. This is just Western researchers. A new organ. Uh, you saw this headline in many, many different places in, in respectable magazines. And what they were referring to was something called the interstitium. Uh, the interstitium is it, it's um, these sort of fluid-filled spaces and sacs 
it's a network. It's hard to describe. <laughs> it's a network of fluid-filled spaces uh, throughout the body, all over the body. Okay, and I guess they, researchers knew that these things were there, but what they didn't know was how much circulation goes on in these spaces. It's really a, a waterway, sort of a network, like a highway of fluid through the body. And it's not a small amount of fluid. It turns out it may be as much as one third of the water in your body flows through these, this new organ, the interstitium. So that's rather significant. Sorry, Sergeant Pepper is sometimes in charge and he decides that we have to stop and smell something. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering how I have a free hand and I'm holding a camera, it's because his leash is strapped to my belt. I got that question a few times in my last walk and talk. So it's, uh, it's magic, but he's just basically strapped to my belt here. Okay, so I use that example of the interstitium to sort of remind us not to be too arrogant when it comes to making assumptions about modern research. This assumption that everything has been discovered and that we know everything, well, that's hubris, that's arrogance, and it's not true. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you another example in a moment. So uh, w when it comes to the interstitium, though, this is really fascinating. We have this complex network of fluids running all through the body, and really they're still trying to figure out what's, what's going on with these fluids and what they do. Okay, so that's one example. Let me give you another example. There's a network of connective tissue called the fascia that runs all through your body. It really touches every corner of the body. There is no part of your body really that is not um, penetrated by fascia. So it wraps all of your organs, it wraps the muscles, it, it penetrates into the muscles as well. And it's really this um, sort of matrix and network of connective tissue that runs through every part of your body. Uh, I was having a conversation recently with a colleague and she's just all about the fascia. She's more from the Western side of things and fascia is her topic. And we had a fascinating, ha, huh, no pun intended, a fascinating t discussion about the fascia. And it reminded me of how, you know, this is a modern area of research that even from the Western perspective, uh, people weren't talking about the fascia like this 10, 20 years ago. It was, they knew it was there, but they just thought it was this sort of connective tissue, you know, that didn't have any real purpose. And now the latest research is suggesting that the fascia is incredibly important, that it may have all sorts of functions, that it, it's bioconductive, it is involved in collagen production, it, it, it may carry information, and it definitely has some sort of connection to the central nervous system. So uh, your, your fascia sort of reacts to the state of your nervous system. In other words, the stress that you experience in your life is felt and, and manifests in your fascia. Um, for example, if you've ever had like a knot or an adhesion, if you get a massage and you find there's like a little, what is that? It's like a rock in your shoulder or someplace in your body. Uh, that adhesion is bundled fascia. It's all twisted up. And what that does is that, that bundled fascia prevents the muscles uh, from working correctly and maybe it prevents more. So in the Chinese tradition, we would call that it's actual, actual blockage. There's an actual physical blockage there as opposed to just an energetic blockage. But, you know, that physical blockage may also block the flow of energy. And in fact, it definitely does. I mean, from my perspective, it absolutely does. So this is another example of a new area of research that is very fascinating and, you know, it's there's a lot that may be discovered, especially in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I use these two examples, the fascia and the interstitium, because they really do remind us not to get too carried away in passing judgment over the past masters, especially on topics like the meridians. So it's tempting to dismiss ancient Chinese medicine because, you know, we, we cut open the body and there's, where's the meridians? There's nothing there. It's just nonsense. But of course, the world has changed dramatically. We live in a world where we know that energy is very, very powerful and we live in with an understanding of quantum mechanics and energy on many different levels. So it's very, uh, I would say it's, it's arrogant to just dismiss the wisdom of these past masters. They were onto something. They were onto something and I believe 
that it's important to maintain a healthy respect for the wisdom of the past masters because they were right about a lot of things. And I'll give you an example. So in the meridian theory, we have the 12 primary meridians. And most of them correlate with an organ that you've heard of, like the spleen or the kidney or the, uh, the, the lung, the heart. You know, there's just lots of organ systems like that in the 12 primary meridians. Uh, but then we have this thing called the Sanjiao which translates to the triple warmer or the triple burner. And there's no organ that we know of that correlates to the Sanjiao. In uh, Chinese medicine and meridian theory, the Sanjiao correlates to a, like a river of fluid and heat through the body. And it's separated into three parts, the upper, middle, and lower sections, or the upper, middle, and lower uh, burners. Okay, so that may sound a little familiar to you, right? So fluid, a waterway that's responsible for fluid and heat, and heat we can uh, translate as energy in this case, that uh, the ancient Chinese masters used the term heat, but maybe they were referring to energy. So when you start to compare the, the fascia to the Sanjiao, and to the, not just to the, the anatomical version of the, of the fascia, but to the functions of the, sa the Sanjiao, it's really exciting. It's an exciting time to be alive because there's so many parallels. And how cool is it to discover that wisdom from thousands of years ago, uh, before they had microscopes or fancy schmancy equipment, uh, these past masters were really tuning into something. For example, the fascia does seem to separate into these three areas, sort of upper, middle, and lower. There's um, areas of, of, of the fascia that sort of separate themselves to even quarantine or, or, or fence off like infection and other things like that. So, you know, there's something there to the Sanjiao that the past masters were tuning into. And this is really my main theme here in this talk is I would like you to have respect, maybe even a little more respect for the past masters with these recent discoveries of the interstitium and the fascia and who knows what else will you know they'll discover in, in research i mean there's just a lot in this world right there's more in heaven and earth and are dreamed of in all of your philosophies as shakespeare said who knows what what they will find and you know we're just discovering the very surface of these these systems. Uh, what will we discover that these systems can do or that they regulate or how do they integrate with the nervous system or the interstitium, this fluid going all through the body? How does that how does that relate to, for example, inflammation or something like that? So let's have some respect and maybe some patience for the past masters and let's see what happens. It is an exciting time to be alive. I'll tell you this, uh, from my own experience practicing Qigong for many, many years, I can feel the meridians. And if that sounds fantastic to you, well, you know, I, I spend a lot of time demystifying these arts, so let me just try to demystify that a little bit. I can feel the meridians, and it's not that big of a deal once you start practicing a lot. There's really something going on there. And in fact, the explanation for how I can feel the meridians and the flow of Qi may end up involving the fascia and the interstitium. I, I don't know. Uh, but I can definitely feel something and so can my students and what I feel matches what the classics describe you know in terms of the meridians and the flow of chi through the body so there's something there so you can get your own experience of the meridians then we can wait and see what happens with uh, modern research and most importantly meridian theory is useful it helps us to get better results with qigong so for example the theory of the run and the do meridians, which are part of the eight secondary meridians, or the eight extraordinary meridians, they're usually called. Uh, these two meridians connect and form what we call the small universe, or the microcosmic orbit. In Chinese, it's the Xiao Jiu Tian, and it runs down here, down to the perineum, then back up the spine, around the top, and we connect it here. When you connect those two uh, uh, meridians, you not just connect them, but you have to develop a strong flow of qi along them. That's what we call the small universe, and that's a very important uh, part of especially advanced Qigong training. So meridian theory is useful in many, many ways in acupuncture, in Chinese herbology, and in Qigong. And I think that there's some wisdom there that we should respect without being dogmatic. We don't have to buy into everything, but we shouldn't write it off. Uh, I think that is just hubris. That's just our modern arrogance, 
thinking that we know everything, which we do not. In a couple hundred years, they will laugh at us for our ignorance, just like we laugh at people from a couple hundred years ago. But, you know, in the West, we're used to that. We're used to looking back and laughing at the ignorance of uh, people before us. But when it comes to some of the wisdom from the East, well, they figured something out. They had plenty of ignorance as well. But when it comes to things like Qigong and Chinese medicine and uh, meridian theory, they knew a thing or two, and maybe we should respect that. And if you're asking me my opinion, absolutely, I think, uh, based on my experience, the meridians are real. And I think that in my lifetime, we'll, we'll see some actual concrete scientific evidence of the existence of the meridians. So there you go. Those are my thoughts. I hope that was helpful for you. And I look forward to another walk and talk again with you in the near future.